Well, good evening, everybody. I'm Peggy O'Neill, the Adult Services Programming Librarian here at Penfield Library. And I'd like you wel to welcome you all to our special series um, in the making of In the Moment. Uh, this is the first program that our library is sponsoring. And thanks to uh, Lara and one of our colleagues, um, uh, Lila Grills, um, I learned all about this. And so without further ado, I'll have um, Jean, um, Jean Strazabasco and Amanda Chestnut take over. And I'll let you um, describe the project. Okay, ladies. Thanks so much, Peggy. And okay. thanks for having us. Uh, Jean, I think you said you've got a PowerPoint to share. I do, but why don't we just start with a little introduction of ourselves and then I'll go all fancy schmancy and share. Yeah, thank you, a co-host too, Amanda. Yeah, we, go. sure. we got that, yeah. So Amanda, okay. why don't you share, why don't you just give your little background and then I'll do mine too. Okay, I can start. Uh, my name is Amanda Chestnut. My pronouns are they, they, them. I'm currently an educator. I work at uh, SUNY Geneseo and at St. John Fisher College. Uh, I'm also an artist, a curator. Um, uh, juror, I'm writing, I jurred the uh, Finger Lakes Art Show at the MAG for this summer. And I um, occasionally write for city newspaper. Um, I have an MFA in visual studies from visual studies workshop here in Rochester. Uh, my undergrad is in art history from SUNY Geneseo. I um, lived in Rochester for, I don't know, 15, 16 years now, I think. So a little while, it's home. Uh, but I'm from Binghamton originally. And um, that's about it, right? Is that, that that's the kind of stuff you were thinking about going over, Jean? Yeah. Am I missing anything critical at this point? No, no, it'll, we'll get to all those other things, the amazing things you do. I'm Jean Strauss-Abasco, retired um, French teacher. I've been out for six years. And- um, in, Been out. <laughs> I know, I've been out. And yeah, Peggy's chuckling. It's like, yeah, it's nice out here. But, um, and, and in my, in my teaching life, I was also um, a staff developer. And I um, did a lot of training with uh, safe zones and our um, creating safe zones in our classrooms, as well as, um, Hidden bias. I created and, and ran the hidden bias training for Pittsburgh schools for probably four years, as well as religious diversity. It seemed like every time we needed to shift and start thinking about all the people, not just the white Christians, not that there's anything wrong with that, but not just the white Christians, um, I'd be out there interested and ready to roll. So this this project um, kind of, kind of not kind of, this project, it makes sense. So I'm going to share my screen because I've got some beautiful pictures and, and you will see them shortly. All right, can you see that beautiful picture? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So in this moment, the full title is Revolution, Reckoning and Reparation. And when we created this thank you card, because as soon as you start a project and people start helping you, you need thank you cards. And I like the color red for revolution. Um, it also reminds me of all the blood that has been shed and still continues to be shed in our black and brown community. And we, you know, Amanda and I are serious about the reckoning part as well as the reparation. Um, so, so what is this project? It is these, um, it's about chat books. And I'll give you a little bit more of how they came to be and Amanda will too, but I never knew what a chat book was. And I thought it was a chat book, but it's a chat book. And I think um, it came from England, English, Scottish, Irish, somewhere on that island, where if you really, really care for someone, you know, your chap, you would make them a little book, you know, maybe about your friendship, commemorating things. And this is the first one that you're looking at. So they're about 20 pages long, beautiful text, beautiful images. And that's um, Sean Dunwoody. So um, the, the way this all got started was, um, sadly, it was Memorial Day and George Floyd had been uh, murdered. And um, it, was a, it, was, it was a stunner for everybody and, and not a surprise that, you know, yet another black male was, um, was killed. 
trying to buy something in a store. I know I won't, I won't go off there, but this was um, <clears throat> what happened was I, I was trying to come to gra grasp with, you know, what, what could I do? How can I, um, you know, in my white world, how can I be helpful? And I'm, I'm in uh, Facebook and this wonderful young uh, photographer named Adam Eaton posted this image called grieving in red. And, you know, this came out maybe a couple of weeks after George Floyd had been murdered. And it was the first time I looked at that and I saw this woman and I saw, um, I saw a woman grieving. I, I could see and feel finally the numbness went away. And this, this picture um, made me cry and, and then made me determined to do, to do what I could. So, so there is Amanda and, and I don't know if our little boxes are in the way, but there's Amanda and me, wow, get back here. Now you know what I'm like in the classroom. So, so here's how it went. It was like a blind date. It was like Harmony, eHarmony or whatever, match.com. I, I, first I call Adam Eden up on the phone. I said, Adam, I love, you know, first we, you know, we're on uh, Facebook and I said, can you tell me about your work? And he probably talked to me for a good half an hour. And um, the biggest takeaway for me was he said, black artists have a hard time getting their work shown. And so, so I, this little teeny tiny kernel of an idea of having a book that would showcase um, black leaders and black arts artists started to grow. The next person I called um, was uh, a friend of mine who who is has very good connections, well connected to the Rochester art world. And I called her up and I said, I want to do this thing. And she said, Well, Jean, you're white. And I said, Yeah, I know. And she she herself was white. And she said, You need to you need to uh, involve black leaders from the community. And I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to have, you know, there'll be black leaders showcase. She says, you need a curator. I said, what does a curator do? You know? And so she said, you got to call Amanda Chestnut. She gave me our information. I called Amanda, boom. Um, and then we had our first blind date. So we only got to meet, you know, on Zoom. But there we are um, at a Black Lives Matter rally. And we are there at uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Park. And we don't even know we don't even know yet that Daniel Prude had happened in our own neighborhood. So there we are, you know, um, there we are protesting for George Floyd's rights and the rights of all black people who are, uh, period. Um, and that's where we met. And there we are with our masks and it was great. So Amanda, I'm gonna shut up for a minute. You wanna, wanna jump in on anything? No, I think, I think that's, that's a pretty good, um, I don't, I, I haven't seen your, all of your presentation yet, so I don't okay. know what your next steps are, but we, um, at this, at this point in time during the summer, I'm in residence at Visual Studies Workshop. They have a residency program, and if any of you are artists, visual artists specifically, um, the call is open right now, so I would encourage you to apply Quadre. <coughs> Quadre, that's you. Quadre's here? Yay. Quadre was here a second ago. Uh, to apply to the visual studies workshop residency program. Yeah, Quadre's there. Um, so um, they have a residency program and I was participating. I was already in the process of publishing a book um, through them, a book series through them. And um, when Jean was talking about publishing a book, I was like, well, if we're, if we're going to make books, we need to talk to because there's um, there's there's a few book artists in the city who I really admire, but there's nobody publishing books the way Tate does in, in Rochester. Anyway, artist books. Um, so we brought we brought Tate in in Visual Studies Workshop, and um, that's um, kind of how at that point in time we we started brainstorming. What, what would this project actually look like and be like and, and how could it exist in the world in a way that was good for the community and um, beneficial for, for a variety of people. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's immediately, a man, and, and the reason that this is so, I think it's so wonderful that um, Peggy and the other libraries are asking about this because Amanda and I really believe that this project can be replicated. You know, it's not, you know, we don't own it, you know, um, you know, go out, go out and do whatever it is your thing, go do it. And hopefully we're going to give you a framework for how to get it started. But I won't lie. I mean, Amanda's connection to uh, the visual studies workshop was key because 
you know, you, you need you need to start fundraising and no one's going to write a check to Gene Strauss Abasco. You know, we needed to have a 5013C as well. So, um, so there's my hair really short and there's Amanda. So um, we are in front of VSW. It's on Prince Street. It's a beautiful building. We're right across, it's we, I, you know, like I live there, but we're right across from Soda. And what happened was um, as these books started to come out, um, the first three, we started getting contacted um, from people who wanted to, to, you know, have us on the radio, have us in a newspaper, have us in, you know, some kind of publication. And Amanda, you got to look, look at this beautiful picture. So here we are. And this was when VSW, or we're on the front lawn of VSW. Oh, come on, stop. Um, anyhow, and, and we brought together a lot of our artists. We brought together- All of them our, were there. This, yeah. was, this was all of the writers and all of the photographers were there. Yeah. Hang on. I'm going to scroll to that picture. There we go. Bam. Okay. So this was like our first big, big moment. And, and, um, and there they all are on the steps. And let me see. And then they even took headshots. So one of the things I want you to, to, to realize is all of these people are working artists. And if you need a writer, you need a photographer, they're, they're all phenomenal. All right. So let me go back to where I was. So I wanted to, sorry, just close your eyes, pretend, pretend, close your eyes. I always tell my kids, don't look. All right. Um, okay. So I, I wanted to, and, and then I'll shut up. So I wanted to have, for, for you to have an idea of the, the chat books and who was involved with them. And Amanda, could you spend a second or more than a second talk about how you magically came up with these names from your community? Please. Um, it's, it's, it's funny because I have, I've, I've had a mentor describe it to me as curator brain. It's just, it's, 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 a way of drawing lines and connections between things that I find to be very intuitive and natural. Um, and the more I do it, the more I realize not everybody thinks like that. Um, so the um, we spent a few days brainstorming a list of leaders is where we started. Um, and kind of put it in a priority wish list order. We wanted to make sure that there was a variety of folks represented. Um, one of the things that I say um, about my own artwork and, and to myself and in community is that there are, are many different ways to be black. And, and that's the kind of thing that I wanted to make sure that this project was representative of. So. Um, we wanted to make sure we had a range of um, age and ability and career and income and gender and um, all like full spectrum um, as much as we could fit in of the community represented in the leaders as, as we possibly could. And as people said yes, we um, paired them up with a photographer and a writer. So um, Claude Jay is here. He was one of the first people who said yes. Um, I sent him an email. I sent him a message saying, I think I have a project. Would you like to? And I think he said yes before I finished the sentence. <laughs> um, uh, another person who said yes was Arturo Hoyt, who took the photograph who's on the screen. Arturo was one of the first people who said yes. Sean and Chris. Um, who are on the screen or two of the other first people to say yes. Um, so Arturo, Sean and Chris became our first tripod. Um, and it was really kind of a, as, as donations came in, um, this project really started to form as funding became available. I didn't want to ask anybody to do any work that we weren't going to compensate them for. And I um, wanted to make sure that even the people telling their stories would be compensated um, because I believe that black stories have value and I did not want to take those stories from people without compensating them for the time and effort that it takes to tell them. Um, 
especially because black stories often involve revisiting some kind of trauma. Um, I, th I think that people should be compensated for that effort. So um, Arturo, Chris and Sean were our first tripod. Um, I put out a tweet that was like, hey, I, I think I'm working on this project. It's going to support black writers and, and black photographers. Um, who's, who's willing to fund it? Can we, could, could we raise money for this? Would you, would you all, you're all talking about wanting to support the black community. Would you support the black community like this? And um, within like, two, we, we had offers for money before we were available to get it. The website set up to take money. Um, we raised $10,000 in a month and a half, um, entirely crowdsourced. Most of our funding has been crowdsourced. We've received some grants um, and funding, um, including from the Monroe County Library System, but um, the majority of our funding has, has been um, small donations and, and crowdsourced grants um, from individuals who wanted to hear these stories. We have some folks who've given multiple times um, because they bought one book and then they wanted the rest or they bought books for themselves and then they bought books for their family. Um, uh, they bought, I know folks who bought books for themselves and then they bought books to put on a table out at work so other people could read them in their workplace. Um, I know folks who bought books and then bought more books and didn't realize that they already had the books they bought so they put them in a little free library. So um, there's, there's a, a real desire in the community to, to hear and understand these stories. And, and that very quickly became very evident um, as, as, as we started to talk to people about this project and, and what it could be and what it would become. Well, and that goes back to my original, I, I kind of glossed over, I thought, how can we change? Like when, when the officer knelt on uh, George Floyd's knee, it's like, wh why is this happening? You know, why, why does this happen? And the only answer I had was um, the white community in general, um, has, you know, our, black people are dehumanized. I mean, there is only, there's, that's the only possible explanation that, that could um, go for how many black folks are losing their lives. And, and it's because they're less than and they're thought of as other. And I will speak from my own heart that in my own experience is I have hidden biases. We all have hidden biases. And one of my stronger hidden biases came screeching out when uh, my husband and I left, um, left. When we decided to leave the suburbs where I had taught, we had both taught and moved downtown. And we live um, right by the little theater. And all of my hidden biases, especially around black males came, they weren't so hidden. So I thought if we can get beautiful images and stories of black people out in the community into students' hands, into adults' hands, into white hands, um, and for the black community to celebrate the richness, richness of their community that they know about, you know, we, we, you know um, that could begin to chip away. You know, I, I know it's a chapbook project. It's not going to solve, you know, the world, but could this chip away and can it be used as a, can these books be used um, to, to start to, to, to start to help. So there's our first tripod and there's and Sean. Yeah. The other, the other thing, if, if we're going to talk about audience, um, the other part of audience that was really important to us with this project was to make something that specifically the people in the project, but that the black community in general could feel very proud of. Um, I, I wanted to create something that would, the, the, the phrase is, is give people their flowers while they, while they can still get them. Um, so I wanted to make sure that we were uplifting people who put the community over their own ego and their own needs and that we were doing it in a way that could be held up, not just now, but into the future, even generationally as a, a, a point of exception. Like, like this is the, the black community in Rochester is exceptional. And, 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 and to know that this community is exceptional and, and full of people um, 
who are valued and, and loved and, and doing incredible, amazing things. And I wanted all of that to be visible for the people in the project and then for their communities around them. And, and another I, um, note about the books, they are distributed through our maybe 12 libraries now, public libraries for free. So it's people purchasing sets and making donations and then they get their set or their double set or triple set. But that's, that was our goal, never to charge anyone to have this book if they wanted it. But you know, good people gave us money so we could give away a thousand, at least a thousand of each of these 10 books. Um, and we've had to, you know, Sean, we ran out of Sean's, we ran out of Herb's. So that's our first tripod. So here is Herb Smith and his essay, he is the third trumpet player and so many other things. When you read the book, you'll know. Um, and Taurus Savant was his essayist and Jackie McGriff was the photographer. And there's Jackie and they're down at that, um, they're at Highland Park. And Jackie says she'll be forever grateful for the person who wrote Black Lives Matter behind, you know, it's been, it's been painted over since then. Um, so that's not one in the chat book, but look at this one. And here's a plug. Um, some of these images and possibly more and definitely more are, you know, you can contact the photographer and say, ooh, I, I, you know, I had this long talk with Jackie. She says, who's gonna want a picture of Herb Smith in their living room? I said, me, okay. Um, and there he is. Um, and this was his favorite picture. Herb said that when he saw this picture, it made him cry because it was the first time he felt like he saw himself completely represented in an image. Well, and a, and a note there is Herb is the first and only ever black musician in the RPO. So if you want to, if you say, oh, there's no systemic racism. Yes, there is. Okay, how can it be? It's not coincidental. You know, this isn't, oh, you know, whatever. So there he is. Ah, um, this is Dorothy and Dorian Hall, mother and son. This was, um, we, we, we got this connection through your husband, right? Or your, your, your partner, Amanda, right? Yeah, so Joe, my partner Joe um, works with Dorian at UPS, but Dorian's also a community activist in the Plex neighborhood. Um, he's currently running for... 29th legislature, maybe? Legislature, county ledge? Mm -hmm. um, but Ms. Dorothy, his mother, has been doing this work for a lot longer than I've been alive. Um, and they're the, the of, of the 10 books, they're the only book that has um, two people represented in it because Dorian has really picked up the mantle, um, especially because of the um, environmental damage that's been done in the Plex neighborhood. Uh, his mother called him in and he has felt called to, to serve his community and serve his neighborhood. Um, since this project started, I've been teaching at Geneseo and one of the classes I taught was on this project and um, Dorian was one of the first speakers who came in to my classroom. Um, and Geneseo students are incredibly bright and driven students having been one myself, I feel confident saying that. Um, but the, the, they really launched with, with de detailed and serious questions about his environmental activism and the work that he's done and several students have since reached out to him and um, made plans to help to had they've come into the city and met with him they've made plans to work with him again um, doing things like soil samples and um, data analysis and that kind of information so um, at so many points in this project things like I, I, I put together the groups in the best way that I can and, and then the best way that that in ways that felt right to me, like Lou and Ralph, I, I knew, knew each other, the essayist and the photographer on this group, but um, apparently they'd never been able to work together. Um, and I'm pretty sure Lou and Ralph have known each other for 30 or 40 years, and they've never been able to work together on a project, um, despite having been artists in the same city for that whole time. Um, so that not only could they do that, but then that they could be published and paid for that work was, was significant to me and important to me and then that the work that they did could then go on to help this neighborhood um, 
continue to grow and to continue to develop and to, and to continue to, to better itself um, is, is important as well. Oh, well, there we go. So this is Lutetia Doucette. And Lutetia, um, who worked with Irene Canio as her essayist and uh, Erica J. And this was another amazing trio. I mean, just look at this. I mean, look at her, she's gorgeous. So she, they decided to, first of all, get an artist to do that backdrop and, and then do the body painting. And, and Lutetia said, I know these are gonna be in students' hands. So she, she found flesh colored you know, underwear, but it's just incredible. And Lutetia was also highlighted over at the Rochester Museum of Science as a change, change maker. Amanda, what would you add about Lutetia? Well, Lutetia was the last person to say yes to participating in this project. Um, she was the 10th leader to say yes and, and We'd already started publishing the books and gotten some of the teams rolling and Jean and Tate were, are you sure? Are you sure? Cause we need to get moving. Are you sure? And I said, we need to have Lutetia. And I'm very, I'm so glad that I waited and this book is so beautiful. But the reason why it took so long was Lutetia didn't, she was aware of who I was through the community because Rochester is small. And, and when you look, especially in the activist community, it then the black activist community, it then gets even kind of smaller and it's rather insular. So she was asking everybody she knew who I was and whether or not she should work with me. So I'm really grateful that they, uh, enough people said yes, that she decided to agree to join the project because um, having her voice included has been so beneficial, not only for the chapbooks, but then being able to speak with her um, in classrooms and in libraries. Um, she has presented some amazing and incredible insightful information on accessibility and on disability justice and on intersectionality. And she's again, another one of the leaders who came into my classroom at Geneseo and has already had multiple students reach out to her and um, download her workbook on, access, on disability justice and, and um, want to work with her in other ways. So um, this is again, another project that has had this ripple going out away from the books and, and more broadly into the community because of it. There have been so many unexpected, amazing ripples. Ah, so here is Deborah McDowell Hernandez, and Lisa Maria Brickman was her SIS, and Rashad Parker, uh, her photographer, and she's standing out in front of um, the Memorial Art Gallery. Um, she's just delightful. I had so so as um, a person who's, you know, my community is very very white. Um, I. Um, and, and, and it's becoming more, you know, more inclusive. I mean, I've actually have made friends. It's wonderful. Um, it's, been, it's been wonderful for me. Uh, Deborah, I met Deborah at um, Sombra Brooks, the first fundraiser for Sombra Brooks, who is now our, our senator. And, she, and so I, I had an inkling of her. And when Amanda brought up, I think Amanda, you brought her up. I'm like, oh yeah, I met her. So uh, Deborah has a really great background. She is um, executive director of Western New York Planned, Planned Parenthood. She used to work at the Memorial Art Gallery and you'll find out more. And this dress is of Mansa wear on Park Ave if you are interested and it's just glorious. No one can wear it like Deborah. Oh, Amanda, wasn't there something cool that happened with this project, I mean, all, with the Spanish? Yeah, so Lisa sent me, uh, Lisa Maria Rickman sent me a message on Facebook and she said, can we have Spanish in the book? And I said, uh, yes. And then I sent a text to our, our uh, editor and I said, how's your Spanish? And he was like, awful. <laughs> I was like, I guess we're going to have to find a Spanish editor too then. Um, because again, I, I wanted, very much to show that there are so many different ways to be black. And I think I knew somewhere in the back of my head that both Deborah and Lisa, Lisa are, are Spanish fluent, but it hadn't been on the forefront of my mind when I when I made this trio. But as the three of they all uh, sat down to dinner at um, Deborah's house and, and were getting to know each other before they did the photo session and, and before Lisa started writing and, and they came up on that they both speak Spanish fluently and regularly. Um, so uh, I, they had asked and, and that's, there is 
Spanish in, in this book um, as a part of the conversation. Well, and then I text my dear friend who is a Spanish teacher and say, we need someone to edit this. Even though they're fluent, you know, you still want, you just still want to make sure the accents. So it really became a, a, such a family uh, affair. This is Dr. Celia McIntosh. The, the way we came upon doc, uh, having, including Dr. Celia was I reached out to the Frederick Douglass Family Initiatives and, and well, this is sad, but I, I, one of my jobs as cat herder slash coordinator is trying to get people to part with their money. And I thought, well, Frederick Douglass, th th they must have some money. And he said, no, we can't help you, but you must include um, Dr. Celia McIntosh. And I Googled her and Amanda and I spoke and she's on the police accountability board. She's, she is a doctor, a, has her PhD in nurse. I mean, she has everything. And that is her photographer, uh, Vanessa Cheeks. Oh, no, it's not, no, Vanessa Cheeks was her essayist and the photographer is Olivia ba Bacco, which is really backhot, but I can't make, I have to make my teeth silent. And Cheryl will understand that, the former French teacher. But her, her pictures are gorgeous too. Ta-da. All right, Amanda, go ahead. Um, Adrian is, um, I felt like Adrian was a real gem to have participate in this project. I was really excited when they said yes. Um, I also know that Adrian is very, very particular about the only people who I consulted about their tripod were Lutetia and Adrian, um, because I know that both of them are very particular about who photographs them and how they're represented publicly. Um, and, and Lutetia had picked Erica, who I already knew and had already had on the list of photographers who I wanted to participate in the project. Adrian picked Coco and Coco had said later in a, in a group meeting that, that she had wanted to photograph Adrian for a really long time. And it was photographing them was on her like dream list of people to have the opportunity to photograph. And, um, she was so so proud and self-assured that we were able to have her photograph for Adrian and Adrian had requested her <laughs> of all of the of all of the photographers in the city Coco was the first person that Adrian had requested and then again was already somebody who was on the list of people I knew as photographers in the city who I would want to have included in this project um, so this is Adrian's former studio um, in Rochester. Adrian's moved to Brooklyn since um, and has a new studio space there. But um, Javon Cooper, the essayist, I did not know at all before this. And again, I asked Adrian for input and they said that this was the only person that they wanted to write about them. And I said, okay, if it's good enough for Adrian, then it is good enough for this project. And there were several moments of of that kind of faith in community that, that happened along the way here where I didn't know the photographer and or I didn't know the writer at all other than on the word of somebody who I know in the community and, and having faith that that is enough and that letting people represent themselves in a, in a way that they are comfortable with and, and knowing that that will be the, the kind of quality product and, and um, be in adherence to those kinds of goals that Gene and I were talking about earlier. Um, that's that's a lot of trust and a lot of faith, but in every single instance in this in this project, it worked. Well, and what when I saw this book, and when, you know, Amanda and I get to see the images, and Amanda curates them, and the editor makes the right the great writing even better. As soon as I saw this book, I thought I used to be the. Um, I started the, the Gay Straight Alliance at Barker Road Middle School, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. And I thought when this, this book needs to be in the hands of children in these clubs, children in these schools, this book will save lives. When you know that, you know, almost 50% 50, 50 of our kids who identify as LGBTQ will attempt suicide. This, this story will save lives. And, 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 the, and the fact that, you know, we have Dr. Celia McIntosh and we have all these people with great titles, there's gatekeeper, you know? Um, so this book is, it, well, they're all special. <gasps> okay. So the last, the last three that you'll see are the last three that are coming out. 
And this is Samra Brook, as Senator, excuse me, Senator Samra Brook. And I had the, the great fortune of teaching her in sixth grade. And I, I know, I, and we kept in touch. And I ran into her when she was talking about, uh, it was during Martin Luther King um, uh, celebration where they brought a, a panel of former Pittsford graduates together to talk about their experiences in our schools and how um, the lack of inclusion, the lack of um, feeling part of, anyhow. So Samra and I reconnected. And it was at that night at that panel, she decided to run and she and her husband moved back to Rochester. And here she is at the Susan B. Anthony house. So you, when you see her book, she will be, she will have some pictures before, when she was a candidate. And then she will have these pictures um, of when, she, after she won. And here, here she is. And, and the, the images are stunning. Oh, and there's uh, Kwaje Donald, who was her essayist, who had to tweak his essay after she won. And, he, and if he's here and he wants to pipe in, I would, I would be honored. And Andre Walker, photographer. So he went out two times. He got two stipends. Nobody's doing anything for free. Kwaje, are you there? Do you want to um, jump in and say anything? <clears throat> I'll say that um, when I met with her, we sat on a park bench um, on Park Avenue. Uh, it was a really cool conversation, and probably two seconds into that conversation, I was like, she's the next senator um, from this area. And uh, being super superstitious, I could not write a single word until uh, the moment it was official. So I had a lot of different ideas in my mind, um, but I didn't want to jinx anything along the way. So I held off on writing, and you guys are gracious enough to, to extend my uh, initial deadline just because I, I, I knew she was going to be, um, you know, someone incredible and so, so special. And I wanted to make sure that the words were, were just right. Um, you know, once, once she was able to finally, uh, you know, officially declare uh, that she was the winner of that uh, campaign. Thanks, Claude Shea. And your essay is just wonderful. Um, the, the other book that'll be coming out is Catherine Kate Mariner and Erica Bryant, who you probably know from reading her work in the, um, in the DNC back in the day and photographer Chris Cardwell. And there's a neat connection to this photograph because Sean Dunwoody um, painted the Martin Luther King, that, whatever that is called, the bowl, the black and people to, so that people could express how they're feeling. And did, you know, thought, did you know I painted with him when, when he put out the call for, for, I still have paint on my flip flops from. No. <laughs> and Marisa and I went down and our, my goddaughter and I went down and paint, he put out a call on social media. We, the, the title of the artwork is The Empire Strikes Black and he painted the entire bowl black, entire bowl top to bottom, including like the floor and set out a box of chalk and it hasn't run out of chalk since. And it's one of the largest art installations in Western New York. Um, you know, it's simply painted black, but it's it's considered an art installation. Yes, and um, and Kate is going to be so at the end of this. Kate just did a presentation on placemaking in Rochester, and she's Great. phenomenal. You you might be. I think she might have other uh, presentations coming up. Maybe Peggy will be able to share that at the end. And Kwaje is an expert on. He's not only a wonderful writer, photographer. He's 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 got it all. He also um, studies public art, and I love art installations, um, art interventions, and. If you have not been down to see this, this um, the Darth Vader Strikes Black, what was it called? No, Empire the, em the Empire Strikes Black. Okay, cool. all right. My grandson needs to come down here. Um, so there's Kate Mariner and she's a delight, a delight. And, and how do we, Amanda, it was like crazy. How did you include her? I know Kate because I used to teach a bookbinding class that she took. Um, so I got to know her through her craft um which she applies in her anthropological studies so um as i'm talking to her about bookbinding um we're also talking about printmaking and photography and and then the work that she does in anthro and the research that she's done in the city um so i already i i've been aware of her work and research pretty much since she moved to rochester um 
so I've, I've actually known Kate and her work for a while and, and kind of been following her career. So when I asked if she wanted to participate, she was really confused because she is, even though she is an image maker, I don't think she really thinks of herself as a photographer. And she's like, I'm not a, I'm not a photographer though. I'm like, no, I don't want you as a photographer. I want, I want to highlight your work. And she was like, wait a second, me? Um, and, and, and again, there, there's so much, uh, one of the things that I said a lot at the beginning of this project was leadership isn't always loud. Um, there's, there's so much being done here that's so important and it's really just members of this community who just have their nose to the grindstone doing the hard work every single day. Um, and then I felt that Kate was doing work that deserved recognition that's really important for, for more people to know about in the community. This is Daniel Ponder. She's an attorney and a, a, an incredible musician. And Quadre, I don't want to, I, I, I know I'm calling on you a lot, but here's a case where Letitia Doucette um, wanted to write the essay of Danielle. And when this book comes out, it's, it's a stunner for a lot of reasons, including Quadre's incredible photography. But Letitia had this wonderful idea. She just listened to Danielle's music, all of her songs, and then created her essay to sound more like a, a call and response. And I can't wait, I can't wait till, till this book comes out. Kwaje, um, what was it like photographing Danielle? Uh, if you've never heard Danielle sing, it's quite the treat. Um, but I don't know if singing is kind of a way to set herself at ease. Um, but she sang more or less the entire time. So it was like a special treat for me to have taken uh, some uh, amazing photographs of Danielle, but to also have like almost a private concert um, of sorts. Uh, that was a treat in itself. And when uh, Amanda asked me to be a part of the project, when you guys asked me to be a part of the project, you know, I was like, I wonder who I'll get. And to uh, get Dan Danielle as um, the person I was able to photograph and to get Samra as, you know, the person I was able to write about were, you know, just two amazing um, gifts. Uh, you know, so a lot of folks know me for public art and, and taking those images, um, but being able to have, you know, Danielle and, and Samra to, to highlight in different ways were, were quite a gift and will, you know, hopefully show folks that, you know, it's a little bit more than, than public art. And, and I do want to say, Kwaje's photos of Danielle are absolutely stunning. Um, as, as someone who's, who's studied the history of photography, and, and, and art history and, and, and museum studies and has looked at a lot of black photographs, black photographers, your, your photographs of Danielle are absolutely stunning. And I'm, and I'm looking forward to, to showing them in other places because uh, they're, like, they're like kitchen table series level stuff. Like literally that was the first thing I said to, to Tate. Um, they're really, really amazing. Can you and I'm not just like gassing you up because you're here, like these, these are, the best photos in the project. All right, so, so can you help some of us understand what a kitchen table series is? Oh, let me see if, can I override your, can you unshare your screen for a second? And I, can, I, can, I, can, I can unshare, I can stop and it's all you. Well, uh, it's gonna take me a second because I have a slow, slow computer. Right, I'm gonna look in the chat and see if, so Jen said they are beautiful. And Kwaje said, two of my favorite photos. And the photos I was talking about is my favorite were the photo of Amanda doing her glamor um, shot, and then the photo of the two of you together. Uh, just two candid photos I just happened to snap, you know, when we all got together. And I think one of the things to note about us all getting together on the lawn that day, it was the first time a lot of the writers and photographers had ever met each other in person. Um, so here are these folks that are in the same community, you know, kind of moving in some similar circles. And there we were on the lawn for, for the first time meeting um, each other. And it was just kind of a, a really cool experience. And I think the one thing that I um, will always credit the two of you for uh, and Tate uh, in terms of publishing is, you know, a lot of times folks say there's, there's not enough, um, you know, uh, black folks in, in the community to, to give this work to. And somehow they were able to wrangle uh, not only folks to spotlight, but then the, those individuals to tell 
uh, the stories. And I think that is something that, you know, may often get lost in translation, but was a very important part of this piece, right? So for me to work with another black photographer or for me to work with another black uh, writer uh, is something that doesn't happen too often. Uh, and to spotlight, you know, some very important and powerful uh, stories of, you know, folks that are in our community, right? And, you know, sometimes, you know, I read Sean's story and I've known Sean for the last two years and there were things that I learned about Sean and, you know, just all of the stories I've sat and sat with and, and read and just kind of, um, you know, just had with me and shared with, with other folks. And I think it's important to not, you know, minimize the work that you guys have done, you know, pulling together artists and making sure that they meet deadlines and are doing things is a, a tough task, um, you know, especially if other things are going on. So I, I think, you know, a lot of the credit goes to you, but just making sure that, you know, these stories were told by the, the right folks. So I'm going to click share right quick and, and put on my, uh, my professor hat. Um, the Kitchen Table series is by Carrie May Weems, um, founder of Lightwork Photography in Syracuse and also one of the best uh, black women photographers. Um, and if we're going, if, if we're going to talk about Carrie May Weems, she's again, like right up there with Lorna Simpson. And um, she is, she is one of the, the living legends of, of black photography. Um, right now. So um, if you do ever have a chance, I saw some of her work in Buffalo three years ago, um, but it is exhibited um, between Buffalo and Syracuse. Every once in a while, it got an opportunity to see her work comes up. And if you do have that chance, I would, I would totally, totally recommend like related searches, Carrie Mae Weems, Carrie Mae Weems, Gordon Parks. So when I say that your photography reminds me of Carrie May Weems work, um, that's, that's not a light statement, but I, but I say it with all seriousness. Ah, so, um, so where will we go from here? I know I wanted to leave time for any questions. I don't want you to think that this is the end. Uh, Amanda and I, you know, we have been given permission to do a second series. And um, there's a lot of exciting secret events that are gonna happen that I will never ever say anything about, but stay tuned. We should um, be able to make some announcements both on the second series and on what's next for this series. Like right now? Uh, we could, I guess. Go for it. Oh, well, well we've um, already invited our first person for the next series. Um, I will be asking everybody who participated because again, I want this project to be for black folk first and foremost. Um, so I'll be inviting everybody to participate it who participated already to, to give us more names of writers and photographers and leaders. But um, we've already asked Dr. Johnson um, to um, be the first person represented in the next set of books and the next uh, volume. I keep saying edition, volume is actually probably the proper word. Um, so for the next volume, Dr. Johnson's going to kick it off and we will probably actually start that. We weren't planning on starting until next summer um, for the next series, but we will probably start his book early because he just had his 93rd birthday. Um, so we will probably get rolling on that maybe even as soon as next month, I'm thinking if, if we can scrap up the funding for it, um, at least to have that on file and ready to go. Um, do you want to give the, do you want to give the big secret, Jean, or do you want to hold out until we tell everybody? Well, Quadra won't tell anyone, right? I'm going right to Twitter, so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Amanda, this is your moment. Go. Um, we have also been in conversation and are planning an exhibit for the summer fall of 2022 for all of our photographers, um, at the Memorial Art Gallery. That's wonderful. So um, we will have a show on this project at the MAG, um, have a chance to highlight the work of the leaders and the writers and the photographers all in that space. So we're working with the curatorial team um, there right now. Um, we'll be working very closely in tandem with them um, to make sure everything is accurate and, and well represented. So um, keep an eye out for all of that. 
Well, and and I'm going to um, part of our proposal is um, to have an educational part. So with, I'm going to work with the education department on creating curriculum uh, around these books so that you know you can get a class set, whatever, or as people plan. So it's good there's a lot of educators on here to think, you know, summer 2022 is not that far away. And I remember when, uh, Cheryl will probably remember this, when they had the Degas exhibit, I made my whole next school year about how am I gonna get these kids to the Memorial Art Gallery and what am I gonna do around Degas that uh, fits with my curriculum and conjugating. So, um, so Amanda, she's not even, I won't even say your age, like this is a big deal. And, you know, to have an exhibit at the Memorial Art Gallery. Um, and I just have to share, we were halfway through, we were, um, we were, I was part of, I took notes. So my official work is taking notes and then typing them up, making them slightly clear and how Quadra referred to deadlines. First time working with artists, yikes. I hope I was gentle. <laughs> More, you were, you were quite generous and gentle. Um, well, I am time, not good at things like deadlines and I'm actually a great note taker, but I can't think and take notes. I have to either take notes or think. So um, Jean takes notes. I, <laughs> I have ridiculous ideas and then people think they're good ideas, even though I think they're ridiculous and then we all run with them. <laughs> Well, and, one and then the, I asked Jean, what did I say? Because she wrote it down like, for me. And, the, and then I have like 39 books. I'm like, oh, <laughs> on this date, you said this. So um, so anyhow, so one of the, that, that's very exciting. So, so you know, you can share with your friends, but we, we want to make a big deal at our picnic, our rap picnic in July. Um, so, this, so yeah, don't put it on Twitter until after the picnic, Quadre. Yeah, please. I didn't so, find it, yeah, but okay. <laughs> so, but start telling your family fall and summer or summer and fall of 2022 if anyone's got to fly into town yeah <laughs> so um there is a phase two i mean yeah we're so i wanted to also we wanted uh, to be able to raise enough money not just to fund these beautiful chat books but to pay the stipends to pay the curator to pay the um well the printing and the paper all those things we, we fundraised over $50,000 and apparently that's a great thing. So, and it is, it is yes, a in a year, in less than a year. In less than a year, less than a year. And there are some contributors on this, um, on this show, this show, and I wanna thank you from my heart. Um, but phase two includes, we wanted to support a black run business that was making great strides with our youth and uh, Rena Golden of the Black Box Theater or the Avenue of, of, I mean, there's many people doing great things, but you know, especially when the Out Alliance closed, um, this is a wonderful safe haven, wonderful place, great theater, great learning place, great venue for our youth and our, you know, our community. And so we're hoping to, to raise $25,000 for her, for her to, to do more. And through the sell of, um, I always wanna get this right, Amanda, limited edition box sets of the images and ephemera, okay? We're hoping to be able to raise that. And that will include images that our photographers have taken. And Amanda, you know more about box sets than I do. Yeah, we're looking at, we're looking at something that's really handcrafted and, and custom designed that represents like a lot of our leaders are also artists like Kate Mariner makes these beautiful photographs and these beautiful little um, zines. Um, she does some really beautiful print work. We have a whole lot of musicians participating. So putting together um, some objects as well as images um, in, a, in a craft set that would be sold. So um, those will probably sell much more slowly than the chat books. We're, we're thinking that the price tag on that is probably going to keep them from going quite as quickly as, I mean, maybe they'll, maybe they'll go really quickly too. Um, you never know, but we, we really do want to um, raise that money for the community and make sure like this is, this is part of the reparations. Not only, not only are we getting word out, but then we're giving money back um, and make sure that that's something that's happening. Um, well, and already a, a few of our photographers have sold some of their images. So we um, partnered with uh, New City Cafe. Um, I don't even know how that, how did that conversation even start? Uh, Jackie, um, Mag Jackie McGriff uh, brought us together. 
so they, for the rest of this year, are featuring artists who participated in this project on the walls in their cafe. Um, not just the artwork from this project, but any artwork um, from those photographers and are helping to promote and sell their artwork. So um, all of our photographers are gonna, the photographers who chose to are going to be, have their artwork available there for sale and viewing. So um, this is, again, um, there's, there's opportunities and, and, and projects that have evolved out of this that I'm like, I, I, know, I don't even know, like, how did, how did that one come about and, and who made that connection? And um, there's, there's, it's definitely kind of developed a life of its own at this point in time. And I know it's 801, but I want you, if, as you see these books and if an image hits you, um, contact the photographer and um, they are- Contact Jean and she'll get you in touch with the photographer. Yeah, Jean, Jean's, yeah Jean's Trozabasco at gmail.com. So I'm also kind of a um, artist agent, kind Jean's of. Sort of. I'll be very honest about that. Jean is the best artist agent. <laughs> the best artist agent. He's about, not just saying that to say it to your face. He actually texted uh, that to me the other day. Of the things that I've been involved with this year, whether they're a Zoom presentation or any of those things, uh, Gina has connected those folks to me. So she is the best. I probably owe you 20% at some point. I'm not sure. But you are the best uh, artist agent. Well, thank you. And very Hi. kind with deadlines. Uh, and I can tell there's a teacher in there because you're very stern in the follow-up if a, if a deadline has not been met yet. So I appreciate that too. Thank you, Quad J. You made my night. I'm not gonna cry. <laughs> but he said it was stern, oh my God. All right. <laughs> All right. It's needed sometimes with uh, artists. <laughs> He well, was trying to get Quaje to commit for a time in the summer. So I think we got to wait till fall for you, Quaje, right? I know. We were trying to get a, a July date and it didn't quite work out with the schedule and Sean. So Sean, it was Sean. Quaje was good. Quaje was, Sean, Quaje, Quaje, Quaje was okay, right? Okay. I'll have to try to, uh, we'll work on that. Thank you so much.